Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to the first colloquium for the spring, um, well, for 2021 spring semester. We, it's 101, so we'll go ahead and get started as we're still admitting folks. We have three presenters that are going to, or that are here, have joined us for um, our talk today. So let me introduce all three. Um, let's start with Dr. Amel Ibork. She is an assistant professor of science ed in the FSU School of Teacher Education. Her research encompasses three areas of science learning, science teaching, and identity across different contexts and spaces. She uses the lens of identity to examine how storied identities or identities that are shaped by stories can inform teachers' practice, teachers' professional identity, as well as the identity trajectory of youth in the STEM pipeline. Dr. Ran Roxanne Hughes is joining us from, she is the director of the Center for Integrating Research and Learning at the National Mag Lab. And her research focuses on STEM identity and the role of informal STEM education spaces. And then we have Dr. Clausel Mathis. Uh, he is a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Washington in the Department of Physics. His research focuses on two things, um, addressing strategies and techniques to develop physics teachers and merging equity into the teaching of energy and understanding common conceptual resources students draw upon when solving physics problems with the intent to help physics teachers and research researchers develop instructional materials that target those resources. So we're excited to have our panel here with us. Um, they've asked for questions at the end. Um, we have, we'll have plenty of time at the end for Q&A, but if you do have something that you want to put into the chat box along the way, we will be monitoring that and we can make sure we come back around. So Dr. Ibork, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, so. All right, so I'm going to start with the title of our, our research talk, which is It Is What It Is, Using Storied Identity and Intersectionality Lenses to Understand What Shaped the Trajectory of a Young Black Woman's Science and Math Identities. I want to actually look at the phrase, it is what it is, and just point out that we were intentional about using and including this phrase in our title because this phrase is um, a phrase that our participant Marie used quite a bit in her stories, but it also, she called it her life motto. It also captured the essence of the title of her stories. So I wanna start with some numbers and how black women in the United States make up 7.1% of the undergraduate age population but they represent less than 6% of the STEM bachelor's degrees. And that representation can vary depending on the discipline. So 1% in engineering, 2% in mathematics, and 5.5% in biology. And this is a report from um, NSF uh, and from 2019. And some of the reasons for this underrepresentation are lack of relevant hands-on STEM experiences in K through 12, lack of role models for connections to authentic STEM research, research for K through 12 and college students, but also the culture itself within STEM disciplines like physics that encourages the attrition and exclusion of underrepresented groups. The research questions that we sought to answer for our study and our paper were, what are the storied identities that shape the trajectory of a young black woman's science and math identities? And then we also sought to answer what emotions and domains of power shaped her storied science and math identities? We drew from a framework called Science Identity by Carlone and Johnson, and this is one of our, our theoretical underpinnings for our study. And this particular framework uh, was what helped us further look at how Black women, how women of color see themselves as science uh, people. So Science Identity Framework, Carlone and Johnson Science Identity Framework looked at three lenses or three dimensions that one, 
sees themselves as a science person through these three dimensions. The first one being recognition, the second one being competence, and then the, the third one is performance. So recognition, the lens of recognition is basically how one recognizes themselves as a science person, but how others perceive them as a science person. And then performance, the lens of performance would be the social performances of relevant scientific practices or how they do science, how they engage in the practices of science. And then the last one is competence or the knowledge and understanding of science content. So for example, if uh, they, someone scores an A in biology, that means they're competent in that subject. Um, or the grades that they get makes them competent in that content area. So these were the three dimensions in uh, the science identity framework. And we really drew from the lens of recognition. And we'll talk more about that um, in the following slides. So we conceptualize science and math identities as how a young black woman recognizes herself as a member of a STEM field across different settings and over time which changes with her perceptions and how she emotionally navigates her experiences and the domains of power within science and math. We really want to make it clear that STEM disciplines are oppressive to black women. And Marie's storied science and math identities are used to illustrate how she moves through both science and math disciplines and how she navigates this oppressive nature that is found in STEM and then in this transition for her from science and math as well. We used the lens of intersectionality and the intersectionality lens was uh, coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, which is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it locks and intersects. And we use this lens to further look at the different identities that surface in the stories of Marie, of her becoming a science person, of her becoming a person, um, becoming a math person, her um, sub-identities that surfaced, her racial identity that was salient, her math identity, how it overlapped with her racial identity, or how her racial identity overlapped with her science identity. So we definitely drew from this lens to further unpack her storied identities. And that the use of an intersectionality helped us focus on the structural inequalities and systemic oppressions that affect Black women's educational experience. And this is why we found it really useful and helpful to use this lens in further getting at the why that um, answered our question and, and further unpack the storied identities. So it also points to the factors such as power, privilege, and institutional barriers that affect the mental processes and educational choices of Black women and girls in STEM education beyond their individual characteristics. And this is the reason why using an intersectionality lens was so powerful for us. And we focused on Marie's story to highlight the intersections between her various salient identities, including race and gender, and how domains of power shaped her trajectory in STEM. And the four domains of power that we really focused on were her in, the interpersonal domain, which was the power expressed between individuals. The second domain of power that we focused on is the cultural domain, which looked at how a group's values are conveyed or contested. So for example, seeing specific STEM discipline as the work of white middle-class males who conduct research in isolation and are innately talented. And then the structural domain, which is how power is allocated within large social structures. For example, in physics, a department, so how they readily joke about weeding out uh, students because of some courses being intentionally uh, difficult. And then the last domain of power is a disciplinary domain, which is how rules and regulation get enforced and for whom. So is competition praised over collaboration or is the growth mindset supported and promoted? So these were four domains of power that we looked at further to uh, get a, a sense of what, um, 
helped us understand her trajectory in STEM. So the few studies that have explored science and math identities and intersectionality for women of color have called for more research that can help to develop a stronger understanding of the experiences of women of color who persist to determine how they recognize the STEM people and how they maintain their own confidence in their belonging despite moments of doubt. And this is what we found to be lacking in a lot of the studies out there is that there are a few studies that looked at uh, how we can develop a stronger understanding of the experiences of women of color, but from these lenses and understanding why they persist and who persists, but also acknowledging the important role of emotions in shaping one science and or math identity that by looking at the emotionality, we're also recognizing that becoming a science and or math person is a humanizing experience. So the methodology that we used for our study was narrative inquiry methodology. So we looked at narratives and stories and this methodology renders life experiences in relevant and meaningful ways. It tells us what Marie, our participant, drew from to make meaning out of her stories, but it also captured the contextual complexity of her fluid and dynamic stories. We also use the storied identity approach. And the reason why we use the storied identity approach is because we were able to look at the stories that she told us that shaped her identity. So exploring stories that shape one's identity highlighted the moments of recognition in Marie's story about becoming a science and math person and how it shaped her identity trajectories. And that Marie's science and math storied identities were shaped by her experiences moving across different settings, time and spaces, but that also were affected by these four domains of power, the interpersonal, the cultural, the structural, and the disciplinary nature of these landscapes that she was in. So who was her participant? Who was Marie? So Marie became the focus of the study as part of a larger study that focused on the STEM identity trajectories of women of color who participated in middle school summer camp STEM girls during one of the summers between 2006 and 2014. And we chose to focus on Marie because her stories were rich and she had this ability to reflect on her experiences that made her stand out. But her ability to see and describe her racial identity both empowered and constrained her story, science and math identities. She began college as a biology major, but switched to a math major. And she was enrolled in Spelman College, which is not a pseudonym. And she gave us permission to use it. And Spelman College is an all women's historically black college or university in HBCU in the US. And that was um, a unique, uh, very unique to um, her experience as well. And the data sources that we looked at and analyzed were open-ended responses on Marie's applications, pre and post survey data from her participation in multiple years of the STEM girls camps. We also did a life history interview as well as a follow-up interview with her. In our first level of um, in, in our first level of coding uh, for data analysis, we developed a codebook to further guide our analysis of the life story interview, and we also looked at the application, the pre-post survey data, as well as the follow-up interview. We used Envivo, which is a qualitative data analysis software, and used line-by-line -line coding techniques to develop code. Some of the codes that we developed were influential people supportive experiences, tensions among identities, lack of support, interwoven storylines, memorable events, moments of uncertainty and productive struggle. We drew from Carlone and Johnson's framework of science identity, particularly the recognition lens, and we coded for moments and sources of recognition in her stories of becoming a science and math person. And then in our second level of coding, 
we focused on the codes and the ways in which the domains of power influenced Marie's trajectory in uh, science and math. We applied the intersectionality lens to further unpack the emotions. So there were some empowering emotions that surfaced like uh, joy and pride. So these were positive emotions. And then the negative emotions that these, this empowering negative emo emotions that surfaced were frustration and self-doubt. So we use this intersectionality lens to further unpack these emotions that surface in the domains of interpersonal, cultural, structural, and disciplining and what it can tell us about how she acted upon these emotions and how they either constrained or enabled her own self-recognition and informed the development of her science and math identities. Lastly, we used triangulation, searching for discrepant evidence in negative cases, member checking, and also we had rich data. When uh, we finished our final round of analysis, we asked Marie for her views and thoughts about our analysis. And she responded with, I really enjoyed reading excerpts from my essays and I agree with the findings overall. This was much cooler to read than any horoscope personality test. So that was um, her uh, feedback for us. So I'm gonna pass it along to Roxanne who is gonna uh, dig into the results and uh, discussion as well. Sure, thank you, Amal. Uh, so before I go, I just want to let everyone know that Marie's voice cannot be as eloquently portrayed by me in this presentation. And I've taken some select quotes, but um, when the paper is published, we highly recommend that you read more of her voice in that paper. So um, Amel, if you'll go to that next slide, I'm gonna break this down into her story, starting with her K through eight experiences. And there were three particular identities that we saw coming through. Early on, it was her STEM identity and her racial identity. I'll talk about the third in that next slide. We purposely used the term STEM because at this time, in elementary and middle school, she's really talking about various types of STEM that she's interested in. So science, technology, engineering, and math, they're kind of all together for her. So uh, throughout her K through 12, um, in, in particular, this early uh, aspect of her life, she had incredibly supportive parents and teachers. Uh, she won uh, multiple STEM competitions during her elementary, late elementary and middle school years, and she attended a number of STEM camps each summer. When asked what about those STEM camps influenced her interest, she said, I think those science camps were more focused on science exposure. So like the fact that we actually did projects and then had fun with those, but also explaining the science behind them was her way to articulate what made those more interesting and kind of kept her interest even um, compared to her formal schooling. In terms of her racial identity, she had a really strong racial identity as a black girl at this time. Both of her parents went to an HBCU and really instilled this idea of the empowerment of her black identity. She did notice in reflecting that throughout her K through eight experience, she only had one African-American teacher in all of her uh, classes and her formal schooling. She also participated in a STEM summer camp that was held at an HBCU. And you'll notice that I um, underlined the sense of belonging below. You'll see that I also will boldface in our, on our presentation to show you where we have an overlap, that intersection between, the racial, between her racial identity and her STEM identity. When asked about that STEM camp held at the HBCU, she said, I definitely felt a sense of belonging because that was the first time I had I think a black science teacher besides my third grade teacher. Like that was my first experience with a real black scientist. I also felt included. So kind of showing the sense of belonging and how those two identities intersected at that point. So moving on to her high school years, here we start to see the third identity that we noticed in Marie's stories. And that's this being smart identity that she references. So first I'll talk about, we start to see how she differentiates between science and math in high school. Again, supportive teachers, her family is incredibly supportive and her teachers in high school are not just supportive of her interest in science and math, but also of her college aspirations. She made a point to tell us multiple times of how um, she felt really supported by these teachers as they told her, you know, yes, college is definitely for you. 
Um, and also she, at this point in high school, starts to tutor her peers. So she has a quote, we didn't have room on the slide, so I'm gonna read these uh, quotes that highlight these identities for her. And she says, that, that was like a common occurrence for me, just having the kids sitting around me ask me questions, like thinking back, I suppose that whole thing of being asked for help in math made me think, like I can do this. But at the time, I don't think it felt any different because I just felt kind of like the smart kid. So I don't think it really stood out to me. But thinking back, that's probably like kind of a subconscious reinforcer of my own competence in math, like having other people like my peers ask me questions and feeling I'm confident enough to explain it to them. So this shows you one, how confident Marie was, but that this recognition from her peers and the advocacy of her math teachers to say, go to Marie if you have questions, begins to show us the support of the performances that she has in math and science and the recognition that she receives from the teachers. This is also an indication of how she was confident in being smart. She saw herself as smart and that was what allowed her to be a good tutor for these students. But what she realized in high school is that early on, this was because algebra, geometry, those courses came really easy to her. She didn't have to do much work, it was just, it came to her naturally. And that's what she thought being smart was. We also start to realize that this is when we start to see, when she starts to call into question things not coming easily, and if that means that she is no longer smart. So I'm gonna read a quote here, but you'll also start to see her articulate some of the racial identity doubt that she held at some point as well during high school. So in reference, calculus is the class. And when I say that, many of you probably remember that yourself, but calculus is the class when she began to think, this isn't coming easily. Does this mean that I no longer belong? And so she said, I remember just thinking for like a while that I don't understand how all these white boys are getting it so easily. Why am I struggling? I would talk to my mom about it and she'd be like, I wish I could help you more. You know, we can try to look at stuff online like Khan Academy and stuff. And I would stay after school sometimes to get help from my calculus teacher. I would try to work on it with him. And it was just kind of like, I wish it came easier. Because before then, I had never really struggled with any math concepts. I got to calculus and I was like, I don't like this. I don't like feeling like I can't do it, just like everybody else can. So that definitely took some work. So you can see through this quote that we've selected that Marie did eventually start to get calculus, quote unquote, but she had to do some extra work for it. She had to do uh, some tutoring from her calculus teacher and she was just frustrated that she wasn't getting it as quickly as she thought the other students were getting it. This, and she also articulates this idea that what she noticed was that the white boys were getting it faster. So we start to see this differentiation in terms of racial identity here. So going to this third identity of her racial identity that was salient to her, we see also some supportive aspects in her development of both her racial identity and her science and math identity. In her junior year in high school, she had a science internship at a local HBCU. And as luck would have it, her partner in this internship was another alumni of STEM girls who also was an African-American girl. And she speaks to this idea of being paired. They hadn't kept in touch, but they were paired during this internship. And since then, they have made contact through social media. And she says, just having that experience where both of us were working in a real lab and we were together in that and together on our learning and our experience. And it was just really nice to have each other in that experience. And it has been really nice seeing how we've come from like STEM girls to then that experience to now being in college and going within our majors and trying to get to grad school. It's really, it's a personal sense of motivation to see each other succeed and continue like moving throughout trajectories and reaching our goals. So this interconnectedness of seeing another black woman who's going through maybe similar tr trials and tribulations that Marie's going through and they serve as a source of motivation for each other. And we'll see more examples of that as we move into our next slide here with uh, Marie's experience in college. So what we found in talking to Marie is that eventually, initially she wasn't looking at an HBCU. Her parents really advocated an HBCU as an experience that she might uh, never have again to have that all that experience where it is all black women in this particular experience with Spellman, um, but black women faculty and peers in her life. Um, and I, I really encourage you to read the paper because she talks about her experience of walking, stepping on foot at Spelman and how that was where she had to go. Um, 
But she did tell us about Spelman, being at Spelman, it's its own universe bubble within everywhere else. So the thing at Spelman, like you're with other majority black people, like in my major, my professors are black women, my peers are black women, the administrators, everybody else, black women are everywhere. This bubble that Spelman provided for her. So this was part of her reason for choosing an HBCU. And we also see that as she enters uh, Spelman, she has a strong science identity. At this point, she is a biology major. Her first year in college, she is doing research with a faculty member at Spelman and she presents her research in an annual poster presentation. And she is one of the only freshmen to receive a research, to receive a, an award for her research poster. And so that takes us to this bottom, this intersection of racial and science identity here, this quote on the bottom. I think that this experience has made me more confident of my place as a person in STEM. So now I can say I've had the full experience. Like I worked in a lab, I made my own poster, poster I wrote my abstract, I submitted it, got accepted and presented my research and won an award. I think it just cemented my confidence as a student researcher. It definitely made me want to go farther. And this poster presentation session is for all Spelman students and faculty. So she was recognized by other peers that looked like her. And this really cemented her identity, both as a black woman and her STEM identity. So a black woman in STEM. In her sophomore year, the summer after her sophomore year, she was accepted into an REU program at a nearby predominantly white institution, a PWI. And she also had research experiences in her junior year. So that takes us to the next slide, wherein we're starting to see um, we're starting to see Marie have some questions. We noticed before there was that question of, do I belong because of calculus? And in college, we see some other examples of that. So first we'll go to this transition in terms of being smart. We hinted at Marie realizing that being smart doesn't mean that things come easily. And we see this again in college as she encounters more difficult courses. She realized that it might take her a little bit longer to get some content, content and concepts, but that did not mean that she wasn't smart and it had nothing to do with her race. And so the quote that we have for this is, I've definitely gotten better with that as I've gotten older, this concept of things coming easily. Just cause you know, sometimes it doesn't come on the first try or the second try and you just have to kind of like move on or just, you know, stick with it. And you know, or, or don't, don't stick with it so much that you become obsessed with it, but do what you have to, to do to understand it. And so we see that at, the first interview we had with Marie, she was at the lowest point in her STEM trajectory. And it was because she'd started to realize that biology isn't what she wanted to do with her career. She had initially thought that medical school was what she wanted because she thought that was one of the only opportunities in STEM for her. But realizing that she didn't wanna look at blood or give uh, vaccinations. So she was really at this point because she had identified so strongly with biology. And in our follow-up interview with her, at the time she was switching to math and she was excited about it, but there was some trepidation. So our follow-up interview about six months later, uh, she was able to realize that she had math stories that supported her identity in math. Um, and one of the quotes that we pulled for this particular transition point is this one. I like the problem solving aspect. I think math gives me a sense of satisfaction that I didn't get from a lot of other subjects. Like you can write an essay in English and then you can get feedback and that's it. But for math, it feels like it feels more personal. I find myself much more interested in how math can be applied than like looking at numbers for number sakes. I'm not really interested in pure mathematics and all these complex equations and theorems that are just fun to look at, I suppose, for some mathematicians. But for me, I'm like, if it's not, if we're not putting it to use, then what's it for? So she's able to bring math into these other salient identities of her as a problem solver and a science person. So you can see how she's able to do that. Also, we see her racial identity come into play here as well because it was her calculus professor, an African-American woman who encouraged her to think about math as a major to switch to because of her success and aptitude in calculus. So we see support and recognition from a black woman that inspires Marie as she goes along this training trajectory and switches from her biology to her math major. We'll go into a little bit in the next slide, this uh, aspect of her 
racial and STEM identities coming into play here. And these are some long quotes, so, but they are really, really powerful. And that's why we wanted to bring those here. Um, we start to see um, some questioning, remember her calculus experience. We begin to see some of, um, a little bit of doubts in Marie's mind when she goes to her REU experience at a PWI. Uh, she talks about being at this REU experience and she says, you know, Spelman is a liberal arts college and they focus on teaching uh, so many things outside of just our majors. Pause here. She took an African diaspora class her freshman year, which was is required for all Spelman freshmen. There are other kids whose schools are hardcore tech that they just mm -hmm one freshman prerequisite, and then it's just math, math, math for the next few years. So there were definitely other students in her REU who had a lot more math classes than I had had and were already so far ahead in material that I'd never heard of. They were just, they would just name drop theorems and then laugh and make inside jokes. And I'd be like, what are you guys talking about? So I felt excluded, but since I knew what it was, like I knew what the situation was. So I wasn't, I didn't feel bad about it necessarily because I was like, it's not on me. I just haven't taken those classes yet. I haven't been taught that material. So it's not, it's not even necessarily a bad thing. It is what it is. So here you can see how Marie is incredibly self-reflective to know, even though I don't know this math yet, I'm gonna learn it. It doesn't mean that I don't belong here. It doesn't mean that I'm not gonna get it. I know that I will eventually get it and have that experience and I can still benefit from this REU experience. And then another research project later on in her junior year, she was working with a faculty member at a PWI who asked to bring on a physics major who was interested in the topic as well. And the physics major was a white male. So Marie explains her trepidation with this interest. She's like, and so on the outside, I was like, cool, great, the more the merrier. And then on the inside, I was kind of like, ah, is this gonna be another time when a white boy comes in with his advanced computer science skills and kind of like takes over a little bit? I really didn't want that to happen. And I was nervous about our first meeting, about appearing you know, professional and like I could do it. I had a talk with my mom about it and I came to the con conclusion that like it is, I guess it's my life motto. It is what it is. I came to the conclusion that I just had to not even think about it because I have a habit of overthinking a lot of things. So the more that I thought about it, the more that I focused on it, the more worried I became. And I really had to just say, you know, how they see you is how they will see you. All you can do is cover your own bases and present yourself as best you can. Do the best work that you can and just continue to do all of the things that you know you're supposed to do. This really articulates both the support that Marie had from her family, but also her ability to be like, you know what, this is, I am, I feel like a strong, empowered person that belongs as a Black woman in STEM. And what she's referring to here is one of the things that she worried about was at Spelman, they were taught to call faculty by doctor. And the white male physics student would call the faculty at the PWI by the first name. And she didn't feel like, at first she was worried, should I change that? And she didn't. She didn't change what she had taught in the culture that she had learned at Spelman. She maintained that and felt really strong in that culture and in her decision to continue that culture, even in her interactions. And even though we see that doubt of, does she belong? Are her, is her expertise valued, she realized it is valued and it doesn't detract from it if my experience at Spelman is different and I interact in a different way. So this also starts to show us um, some of the ways in which Marie is able to do this. So in the next slide, we have some sources of motivation that Marie articulated for us. So you see that she's able to pull from um, multiple experiences including going back to that calculus class where she just worked hard at it. She went to get extra help and eventually she was able to understand the content. Marie has many stories like that. And again, they're all in the paper. These are just two highlighted quotes to show you some of these. But she particularly finds sources of motivations from stories of other black women and also stories of just herself as a black woman overcoming microaggressions and maybe other um, moments in which she's experienced racial or um, sexist microaggressions. So one of the first examples that she gave us in college was when she was at that REU experience at the PWI. She says, I was looking at the display board in the building here at the PWI of all of their graduate students and faculty, and there are no black women in the faculty and no black women undergraduate students. 
They're all the staff and secretaries and such. So it's important to me seeing just how, like I knew that we weren't represented, but just seeing it firsthand here at a school that's like right down the street from Spelman has been pretty eye-opening. And I kind of like, it kind of like lit a fire in me to continue on this track and go as far as I can. So this idea that she's the only one in this major, in this REU experience, it was a source of motivation, not a source of isolation that made her question whether she belonged in these fields or not. And then at one point she talked about uh, feeling like a pioneer. And when we pushed her on that, like, what do you mean by a pioneer as a, as a black woman in math? She says, I feel like a pioneer because you know, when you are the pioneer or the first one in the situation, referring to being in mathematics, that's a lot of weight for you to carry in terms of representing everybody who's similar to you in the eyes of everyone else. So not only are you like the representation for the whole, but you have to balance, you know, microaggressions and like feeling tired and just kind of worn down because you shouldn't have to represent the whole and yet you kind of have no other choice. So those are definitely difficult things within it. Just whatever space black women enter where there, where there are, where there are none before, they have to deal with all that. But overall, the significance is definitely a positive thing because I wouldn't want to do anything else. And it's not a responsibility that I would shirk or anything like that. So Marie is articulating the sense of being the only one, realizing that she shouldn't have to be the pre have to deal with the pressure of being only the only one, but realizing that that's the role that she wants to play. So moving on to our discussion slide here. And again, we only scratched the surface of Marie. As you can tell, she's a pretty amazing person. Um, but in terms of what we noticed is that her identities, those three identities of her STEM identity, her racial identity, and the being smart identity, we see moments wherein those are intersecting and strengthening um, and creating this identity of her as a black woman in math. Uh, we also see stories of resilience in science and math that allowed her to persevere and, and helped her to persevere through moments of micro microaggressions and moments where she felt attention, that low point where she was deciding between biology and math. And in, in addition, we saw that Spellman, attending Spellman gave her a space where her racial and science and math identities were mutually supported so that she could develop stories to help her overcome the domains of the power inherent in STEM disciplines. And I will hand that over now. I will hand it over now to Quazal uh, for our implications and conclusion section. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, now, for the implications, uh, Marie's stories provide evidence for the value of our research methodology. Um, our analysis using a story based approach gave us a more deeper, nuanced understanding of Marie's transition from science to math. Um, the study gave potential for uh, future studies on how to understand women, particularly Black women or women of color, um, how they can develop their science and math identity by unpacking the moments of recognition. Um, in the case for Marie, her being a woman, her being Black, her being underrepresented in science and math, it had an influence on how she saw herself as a math and science person, which was evident when she spoke on certain moments, uh, when she experienced doubt, um, when she was the only Black girl in the REU program. And so based on uh, Marie's statements, this indicates there are external factors that can impact women of color uh, within science and math. Uh, we are encouraged to examine these influences and see how they can impact um, how one sees themselves in science and math, both positively and negatively. Let me go to the next slide. Um, additionally, along with these influences that impact a person's science and math identity, uh, we need to understand how these influences intersect with one another in conjunction with trying to understand how women navigate through these interactions. Um, this study allowed us to uncover the power domains in science and math disciplines that impact Black women's sense of belonging. Um, case in point for Marie, by her being Black woman and underrepresented, as I said, in science and math, how does she handle these external influences that impact her um, science and math identity, both positively and negatively? If the influence is positive, does it enhance her science and math identity? Or if the influence is negative, does it create doubt in seeing herself as a science and math person? Um, so for example, any woman of color in science or math who interacts with individuals who give negative or positive influences on their identity, how do they handle that? Um, these influences could be stereotypes, bias, microaggressions, and to connect it to our study, how does recognition play a role 
in how and how they handle it or lack of recognition. Um, for Marie, uh, she was able to persevere those moments when she had doubts. Um, now, what about others who share similar racial, gender, and underrepresented characteristics um, who encounter these types of moments that impact that could influence their um, identity negatively? Does it enhance? Does it cause damage to it? Uh, next slide. Um, so the findings from the study have implications on the need for further research into the role of recognition on science and, uh, and math identity in women. Um, for Marie, her childhood, adolescence, and college experiences uh, played a role in the aspects of her uh, science and math identity. The moments when uh, Marie was recognized, it gave her confidence either in, in grade school or in college. And when she was having dilemmas on which career route to go, her support systems helped her uh, through those moments of doubt. Um, Case in point, when she was having second uh, when she was having second thoughts on her career trajectory, um, she had support from her faculty, her calculus professor at the college institution Spelman, and that was able to help her and give her confidence to where she had more clarity in her goal in being in mathematics. And also, um, findings from our study give theoretical implications in examining the relationship between Black girls and women in mathematics. Um, given that there's very a little research in this area, this gives us opportunity to examine these factors and uh, to understand the cause for these underrepresentations of Black women in mathematics, which ultimately gives a knowledge of understanding what changes are needed to uh, help Black women and girls become more publicly visible in these disciplines, in mathematics particularly. Uh, next slide. Um, and so from assessing Marie science and math, excuse me, assessing Marie science and math identity trajectory, we also got to see the systems that she was placed in. So um, that led to these interactions that impacted her identity. Um, Marie support systems from her parents participating in Psy Girls, high school experiences and attending an HBCU uh, supported her math and science identity. Uh, from a research standpoint, uh, this study gives importance uh, to examining the cultural, social and institutional factors that intersect with race, upbringing, and struggles. Um, in particular, with the HBCU experience of Marie, we need to learn more about what elements within that institution create or cultivate success for um, underrepresented students in science and math. Um, additionally, how do these institutions cultivate students' sub-identities, such as race, class, and gender, and helping them persist in science and math despite societal constraints placed upon them? And then lastly, uh, from a practical standpoint, examining cases such as Marie gave voice for women um, in science and mathematics uh, as far as institutions that yield success for students from these populations. And the next slide. And we would like to thank everybody for attending. And if you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, um, and our emails are listed on the slide. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we can take questions now. Um, I have a question. I don't know if anybody else is going to. I am a math teacher who is currently a doctoral student in policy in educational policy. And I am very interested in working on uh, the understanding of math identity in a way that's very similar to what you guys have done. So it's fascinating work and it really uh, helped to inform some decisions I may make in my own research. But one of my questions is, what are some of the situations where you saw Marie's racial identity foregrounded versus when you maybe saw her um, smart identity foregrounded or her female identity foregrounded? Sorry, that's all. <laughs> I just am wondering about the different context and when each when each identity became most salient for her in your in your research. Yeah, I saw Amel moving, so I thought she was unmuting. That was the the pause. Um, <laughs> feel free to jump in, team. Um, so that's a really hard question, and the way that the way in which we did it was we had basically um, various time points for Marie. So we have open ended questions that she responded to when she was in the summer camps. They, they were at the Mag Lab, um, you know, I'll be honest with, with this group. Uh, so we had those open ended, so we could tell at those points and we see some of them were Psy Girls camp. So when she's referring, when she's responding to a Psy Girls camp, we see uh, more articulation of her gender because it was 
kind of, it was out there because she was in Psy Girls. Um, we see uh, the two interviews, uh, one was her sophomore year and the other was her junior year. Um, we see less of her gender, but that could be the questions we asked in terms of her gender identity at that moment. We see more of, um, in, in some moments we see the racial identity, but these are her recollections of it. So it is hard to say, were those prominent at the time or is that in her recollection of it, which is one of the limitations of narrative research. Um, there are some really cool studies, ethnographies, to see at what moments you will see various identities come to the forefront. Um, but for us, it was the way in which we uh, chose to do the narrative history that the, it might seem like her racial identity was salient at that time, or is that because she's had two years at Spelman to see and to articulate what happened in those moments, we can't necessarily say. I think that's very fair. Thank you. A thoughtful response. I will say while people are waiting to ask, there was a question in the chat that um, I took the liberty, sorry to Mel and Clausel, so correct me if I'm wrong, about stereotype threat. Really great question. It wasn't part of, as you can see, our conceptual framework's pretty long. Um, and we had, it's very, <laughs> we had a lot of uh, theories in there. So we did not include stereotype threat, but absolutely plays a role. Um, so for all of you folks that are interested in that, I highly, highly recommend looking at the influence of stereotype threat, particularly for black women in STEM. Dr. Andrews Larson, is that your hand up? Yes. Okay. Um, so I really appreciate the point you all made about like this mutual support around racial and gender and STEM identities that, um, I'm sorry, I forgot her name, your participant, <laughs> um, got through these various sources that were part of her life experience. Um, and my question is one that, you know, I'm asking you to go beyond your data, but you highlight her experience at Spelman and then her experience in this REU at a, at a predominantly white institution, which we obviously are here at FSU. Um, and I, you know, part of me is like, so is the answer that, you know, everyone should get a degree from an H or BCU for their undergrad and then come to a PWI once, you know, <laughs> once their STEM identity has been developed in an affirming space. Um, but I feel like there should be an answer for that for PWIs, like we should have better tools for creating spaces that are racially affirming and that are gender affirming. Um, so how do we do that? <laughs> I, I don't know, honestly, I don't know if there's necessarily a pinpoint answer to that question. Um, I will say from, I guess maybe my, and other people's, as you're speaking as a person who shares the same race as Marie did. Um, I think that um, when students feel validated academically at the, when they feel valued from an academic standpoint, um, I think everything else generally takes care of itself in terms of the whole issues of their racial identity, maybe gender identity. It, it will still be there, but it will be, they will be able, it will be lessened if that makes sense. Um, if a student feels like what they bring to the university or what they bring to a class or what they bring to a, a group from an academic perspective in a university setting, that is, um, they will feel more validated, if, if that makes sense. All right. If they don't feel validated academically, they will have these high constraints or these high um, indicators of, you know, are, am I just here because I'm the black person or am I here because I'm the woman, et cetera. And so um, that's just from my vantage point. I don't think that FSU can do what Spelman does um, just because of the history behind Spelman. Um, it's an amazing school. Uh, but I do think that what uh, PWIs, um, and there's, there's research to support this, but PW, PWIs have predominantly white faculty as well as students and white faculty have to start to understand the issues affecting themselves, their implicit bias, their explicit biases of what their expectations are for students of color, of what um, they might even be holding in their head or not even realizing or making assumptions based on race without ever talking to them. So they can't even validate the academics that um, students bring 
that Clausel is talking about because they have so many assumptions in their head. So having those discussions or trainings or workshops to help faculty for with that. Um, and then also having safe spaces or counter spaces for those folks who are aware of, of research on counter spaces. Um, these would be organizations or affinity groups. Um, they can be physical spaces or they can just be networks. Um, so providing support for, um, let's say, uh, if you have undergraduate, so Marie, if she is, if the national organization for math or math education um, would have a, uh, a, an organization that focuses on uh, black scholars, then to support students of color to go to those, not saying we don't have anything for you here, but there are networks that you need to interact with because sometimes maybe if, if you are the only black person total in your entire department, it's gonna be hard for you to have a, to share your experiences as a black person in math. So I think PWIs can use funds to support students of color to find networks both within the university and outside and really support faculty um, in being better mentors to students that just don't like them, that, that, don't like, that don't look like them or don't have the same shared experience or histories. Where's Marie now? She's in her uh, senior year of college and she's looking at graduate programs. So she's still at Spelman. Most likely she's probably at her house because I'm not sure if she went back um, in Tallahassee. <laughs> like she might be doing her coursework from um, home in Tallahassee, but uh, she was applying for graduate programs. And she's definitely still a map. Uh, major. Excellent. Thank you. I have a question regarding the faculty members at PWIs. Um, Earlier, it was mentioned that faculty at PWIs are predominantly white, obviously. Now, what is being done to somewhat change that or to somewhat have a more diverse faculty member? Because there are many minority uh, students attending these predominantly white universities, and sometimes that sense of belonging is not there. So is there anything being done to Im improve the diversity level of that? Um, I can respond to that, Olivet, um, from the position of a chair director. I know when we do searches, we place at a premium um, bringing in scholars from diverse backgrounds. So that's something we actively work to do. We, we recruit scholars of color, um, we very much attempt to do that. It's hard work though. It's, you know, if you're a predominantly white institution, it's, it's um, effortful to get scholars of color to come and wanna work with you. So that, there's that. Um, I have to take some solace in that we also need to make our white faculty much more um, savvy to these issues as Roxanne was saying. So it's not enough to leave the work of making STEM or education or mathematics um, uh, welcoming. That's not the work of, of just scholars of color. It's all of our work. And so we all have to get better at it. I can answer the question from the perspective of what FSU is doing, Olivet. Um, not related to the research, but I serve on the Diversity and Inclusion Council um, for FSU. And they are uh, putting forward to President Thrasher and the Board of Governors and next our next president um, of the university. But they in the, there's been talk of holding chairs and deans accountable 
for diversity among faculty and for diversity efforts. So it's not just a grassroots effort or it's not just certain. So Dr. Sutherland being the chair of the department, they might be doing a great job, but then there's others that aren't. So it has to come from both a desire by faculty to wanna to make that change. It is work on hiring committees and advertising, but FSU wants to, at least the members of the Diversity and Inclusion Council and based on uh, surveys that we've, um, gotten from other folks is that we need to also hold leadership accountable for that diversity. So that is something that FSU is doing. Other universities have done that. And I can tell you on the STEM side of this, um, National Science Foundation and NIH are um, really, really trying to create and provide support and funding to programs that are doing more um, efforts in um, helping um, students of color and faculty of color to not just um, survive, but to thrive in environments. So there are a number of uh, grants that are out there that are looking to do that, but it is slow work. So I appreciate you pointing it out um, to us, uh, but I can speak to, to those two. It's not part of my research or uh, aligned with this particular study, but um, those are the things that are currently being done. Thank you. And I think I have a follow-up question to that. So. Um, FSU is actively trying to improve the diversity of the faculty members. Now, when the hiring process takes place and you have, for example, a white faculty member, a potential white fa faculty member, and a, another faculty member who is a minority or, or a person of color, and the white faculty member is hired, is there any, is there any, um, I don't know how to frame this, how does the hiring committee then go back and examine why the person of color was not hired? Is there any, um, I don't know how to frame it exactly, but it, do they go back and see, well, why wasn't this person hired? Why did we choose the white person over the black person or, or the Latino and so on and so forth? Mm -hmm. And who takes responsibility for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know the answer to, to that question. I think it's a, a really good one. Oh, people have their hands up to answer. Thank you. Um, so last time I was on a hiring committee, I was not the chair, um, but there are a couple things that I think matter. One is the composition of the hiring committee really influences who is targeted um, in the hires. Like some hiring committees really target diversity in their uh in their look at applications um others just want the largest number of publications which may fil provide a different filter um but i know at each stage there's paperwork that has to be filled out by the chair of the committee and my understanding is that every single application that is not moved forward or accepted or hired there has to be a reason and the reasons have to fall into the qualifications that are included in the call for applications. I'm trying to see if Sherry's nodding. It's, um, yeah, it's really <laughs> complicated. Um, right, or at least the last time I, I was really engaged in a search, our search information doesn't even provide information about the ethnicity of the applicants. So it's hard to target underrepresented groups if, if you don't know the ethnicity of the candidates. So, you, you know, we Google people, we, you do a fine tooth comb through their um, CVs. Hopefully um, ideas such as Roxanne was talking about will change some of those barriers that we have. Um, but yeah, it's too late once you've made an offer. You have to really think about putting together a search committee that has the sensibility and charge them with this, you know, like I want to see. Um, and often that works very well. Thank you. We're having a great discussion. It is two o'clock, however, so just pointing out the time. Um, if we have any last minute questions, follow up comments, or anything, now would be a good time. Okay, well, 
Thank you everyone for joining. Please be on the lookout for information coming for February um, and appreciate your attendance. Thank you everyone.